Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The eighth Sunday after Pentecost falls on July 23rd, 2023. And we have a first reading from Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Or if you're following the semi-continuous first reading, that would be Genesis 28, 10 through 19a. We're going to look at Psalm 86, 11 through 17. We continue in Romans 8, 12 through 25. And our gospel reading is Matthew 13, 24 through 30. And then skipping ahead to the explanation of the parable, verses 60, 36 through 43. The parable of the weeds and the wheat, only found in Matthew's gospel. Quite characteristic of Matthew's gospel. How do you tell who's really in, who's really out? Everybody looks the same. Mm-hmm. Some have mm-hmm. oil for their lamps and some don't. Some were invited, you know, now in this case. Mm-hmm. Who's what? And how'd they get there? What are we going to do about it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Which, in a way, I mean, it, the, the verses that are skipped, right, are the mustard seed and the yeast. And that helps a little bit, I think, because it clues us into the fact that recognizing, right, recognizing the kingdom of God, recognizing, you know, the the um, the good seed is not is not always as easy as we think. Uh, that how is you know what do you expect of a mustard seed? You can't see the yeast that is going to leaven the loaf, uh, and so it. I think it does set a context for the this parable and that that wider frame of of what is it that or what are the parameters that you have in mind that that adjudicate decisions of wheat and weed or when the kingdom is present when the kingdom isn't. Uh, who is you know who is the who is who is the, who, who's sowing what, that kind of thing. So just to mention that. And there's a thread in the midst of that from the text that we've been reading before in terms of, you know, uh, what kind of seed is being offered by whom and what will it produce? Um, and that which comes from God is going to produce the good that God has always intended and um, let us not be hasty uh, to try to fix things because we think we figured out who God is, you know, what is God's and what is not. Because as you said, they look kind of the same, Matt. It kind of, I, I, I'm not too real good at t- telling the difference between a sheep and a goat. And I definitely don't know the difference between the, oh, the wheat. We, uh, yeah, I'm, no. I sure don't. For I all my exactly. talk about farming last week, I really don't know what I'm talking <laughs> Well, and the risk is you're going to uproot the the wheat. And so it's, again, I think it takes us back to Jesus saying, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit um, and the merciful and the meek that um, any kind of religious program that, that damages the poor in spirit, even if the cause is righteous, <laughs> uh, is, um, is bad religion. And, and that's and... really what this is saying here. Very mm. much so, because you know they're like, okay, now that we figured out that this is this, these are weeds, and that this is planted by the enemy, let's get rid of it. And there's a yeah. lack of generosity here because doing that right intention, what would seem to be the right thing, would have wrong consequences. And God is careful to avoid those consequences. Are we patient to be careful yeah. to avoid them as well? Caroline, and, I'll cut you out. No, no, no. I, I I was going to point out that this is, you know, the this this reality. I mean, the the parable so identifies our reality, right? In terms of and and the way in which we go about detecting God and and Jesus presence and the kingdom of God and how in our midst and how do we go about being the yield of that kingdom, right? 
I, but it so describes where we are and, and the reality of, of how justice and injustice coexist and how, mm-hmm. how these things live side by side all the time. And, and these realities live side by side all the time. And, and Matthew gave us a clue to this, that this is, this is the reality from the very beginning, you know, that in verse 39, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And Jesus had to do this very same thing in the temptation in the wilderness, right? right. The last time the devil showed up. Yeah. Um, what is what is the devil offering? What is what is what's being placed before you? And how do you how do you adjudicate between uh, between what is God and what is not? And uh, and so it it's it's a parable that really speaks so much truth to who we are as as individuals as as faithful followers of Jesus who we are as a community of the faithful and really who we are as church mm. um, how church goes about um making these kinds of distinctions and and but with what consequences and so it's a it is an invitation to look at one's own one's own individual following, but also particularly the actions that communities, faithful communities, supposedly faithful communities and churches take um, in the name of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the counsel here is to play the long game and, you know, which is, which I don't like, um, and I, I sometimes even wonder if this is a function of my own age and things like that. But, you know, I often will tell students, like, if you want to change the world or change society in a hurry, uh, the church is probably not your best place to do that. And that pains me because I know the church has been late to the party many, many times in catastrophic ways in, in the work of justice. <laughs> the church has also planted seeds throughout history that have blossomed into all sorts of, of magnificent things. But mm-hmm. I, I just don't think that at least the churches we have constructed it now, which is all sorts of problematic, I get, mm-hmm. isn't built for rapid change if part of that change is about being certain about who's in and who's out or what's right and what's wrong. And that's, I could be wrong about this. I know some, everybody agrees, but it's, um, I think the church does change. I think it changes people. I think it does change society. But the risk of uprooting the vulnerable ones or others, you know, is such that I think, you know, it won't do to a 51% vote to do something and you're going to drive 49% away. Um, I don't know. Anyway, that's, I, I go back to this parable in particular. I go back to Matthew a lot when I encounter other Christians in the media that make me say, I'm not so sure I worship the same God they do. Mm-hmm. I just want to mm-hmm. cut ties entirely and, and, and move on. And that's where I'm getting old. No. And I, <laughs> and here I'm going to bring this all in uh, right away because when we think about how do we do this together? How do we do this as communities of faith? Um, how do we do this as this thing called the church uh, this is where the psalmist uh, it, it goes back to you know the reality of humility and and being humble, where we sim- where where we have to say, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Uh, and how how we need to pray that a lot, <laughs> often, frequently. When was the last time that we as a community, as individuals, but when was the last time, you know, the preacher stands up in, in front of the church and says, when was the last time we prayed together, dear church, mm-hmm. teach me your, teach, teach us your way, Lord, and to, and, and to s- sit together in that place of discernment. That's how I, that's how I would bring this home. Uh, uh, that's beautiful, Caroline. The hard part for us is that so much of everything in our society um, teaches us to do things fast for fast results. When we yep. want change, we want them and we want it yesterday. Yep. yep. And um, to pause and say, teach me your way, oh God, is to say, 
Steadfast is a word that is only born after a long waiting, a long time before it comes. And, you know, we just spent a whole lot of time. Um, I struggle with, you know, th the decisions that are made in my own denomination um, on both sides where we just couldn't play the long game together. And uh, on both sides, um, drawing a line in the sand that draws people out. Uh, and on both sides, um, Matt, it just struck me when you said, you know, that 49 to 51 vote. Um, and, you know, it's happening in our society. Um, it's happening in our congregations. It happens in our household across the dinner table. Um, and how do we have the patience and the humility to say, teach me your way, steadfast God? Because yeah. it's a long game yeah. and nothing in the world teaches us to play the long game. And I would also bring in Isaiah here too. Mm. So I'm, just gonna, I'm throwing them all in here now. Go for it. Um, and because, uh, be, because again, it's, it, it, I am the first, the Lord of hosts, right? I am the first and I am the last. Uh, and who has announced from all the things to come. And so the, there's a lot of space in between the first and the last. A lot. <laughs> and that's, but that's what we trust, right? That God, God's presence brackets mm -hmm. the beginning and the end, the alpha mm -hmm. and the omega, the first and the last, what's announced and what is to come. Mm -hmm. But what we've been talking about, right, is that discerning liminal space here and now that uh, that we're trying to figure out <laughs> and yeah. work out. But mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, when we think about well, where's the good news in this? That's where, that's where the psalm and I think Isaiah become those words of promise that we don't we don't do this absent from God's steadfast love. We do it because of because and of. and because of and um, and we can not we couldn't do it without it. And yeah. so God God's steadfastness you know brackets everything that we do. It's the beginning. It's the end. It's and but we but we're in that space <laughs> um, together that that sometimes it's hard to see that reality. Yeah. So, yeah. That's all we I got for Solomon Isaiah. Done. We haven't said this in a long time, or at least in a few weeks, and we've done some um, some hopping around in some books. So I'm going to say with the Isaiah one, this is worth going to read the text before and the text after, because this is actually set in a word about Jacob and the promises made to Jacob. And having that context of that verse confirms everything that you just said, Caroline. I guess we're moving on to the semi continuous so. then. Yeah. Back well, to Jacob. Unless, yeah. That's Jacob's just... on the run here from his uh, his, his his toxic family, <laughs> um, and Isaac. Who let's face it, Isaac was really a dud of a patriarch, right? I mean, Abraham and Jacob are way more interesting than Isaac. Who? Uh... <laughs> yeah, so there's anyway. some work being done. I just got to throw in this: some work being done, recognizing some of the trauma that Isaac experienced that might have made it why we don't hear a lot about Isaac. Could Somebody be. might want to look at that, but we are got Jacob today. Here's a great passage, though, which is actually about God. So let's, you know, go back to all my warnings about the semi-continuous. This one's lovely, right? Where does God meet you? And not only out in the, here in the wilderness, but where God is present. But the, the, again, the covenant is reaffirmed to Jacob. So when you think that Jacob deserves punishment or something, nope, God meets him and says, here's what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to watch over you, right? All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The very thing that you believe to be true about my blessings is true. Even here in this. As you're wherever, on the run. Wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are. Well, and that's, I, I, I mean, it really does go back to some of the themes that we've been raising up for this podcast. But, you know, I, I love verse 11, like, the, the vagueness of that, right? The the ambiguity when he reached a certain place, and that's 
that's kind of what we've been talking about. Like we're in, we're in these certain places, right? Uh, and, but yet that's, but God will meet us there. And, but we kind of have to go to those certain places <laughs> or we end up in those certain places that are, and so the way in which, um, the way in which this becomes another um, opportunity to think about, you know, and for a preacher maybe to ask what certain, what, what is our certain place right now? Um, that we wonder if God will meet us here what, as a as a community of faith, and for a preacher to think about that that would be my homiletical invitation for a preacher with this text is to to listen to your congregation, to think of your congregation, and say what certain place is Christ Lutheran, what certain places you know uh, uh, First Methodist, whatever. Uh, where are we? What what's our certain place and it's 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 noteworthy that you say that caroline because the text the reading ends with this being marked as a place where god has shown up but it opens with it just being an amb- ambiguous place along jacob's journey and um there's a saying that um you don't make memories and I and I like to tell. In fact, I just said this to a friend of mine whose uh, son is getting married, and so they're they're gathering together, and the family's getting together. And the word I gave them as they were starting to travel is, I said, "Don't try to make memories. Pay attention to the things that should be mem- remembered, because we don't make memories. When we try to make memories, we we miss." the big yeah. things. And so yeah. I love that. This is just a certain place, an ambiguous place along the way. But when God shows up, thank you, Matt. Yeah. When God shows up, mark it, remember yeah. it, rehearse yeah. it, because we're going to be in those liminal lanes again. And what's going to keep us going is remembering the steadfast faithfulness of God, the one who is the, the Alpha and Omega. Yeah, and and then I, you love that, and then it, the same invitation of what's our certain place? Uh, how is it that you can help uh, your congregation call to mind the Bethels? Yes, right? where yes. where what have what have been our communal Bethels together? Mm-hmm. Where we've marked them? Yeah, that that the the pronouncement Jacob makes in his line here, right? Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was mm-hmm. not aware of it. Yeah. I did not know it. Yeah, oh, it is. Um, Everybody has those moments. I, I hope yeah. a yeah. lot of people have those moments. But it's also, again, I think as as Protestants, we are not necessarily inclined to think this way. But what makes a place holy for you as an mm-hmm. individual? Mm-hmm. In my experience, when you ask people questions of like, what's a holy place for you? They say things like, well, every place is holy. Or they say nature as if it's just, you know, as if you can get away from nature. But it, it, but to press people a little bit, is there a place, and that could be holy for all sorts of reasons, it doesn't have to be beautiful. Um, in fact, it might be a really ugly place or something really ugly might have happened there, but it remains holy in some way, shape, or form. Be Ooh. attentive yeah. to where God will show up. Yeah. And then you'll know the place you did not know where God is, is exactly where God yeah. is. Yeah. Romans? Are we ready? Are we ready for Romans 8? Oh, boy. Continuation in Romans 8? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think I say this every three years, but there's, uh, I think it was the, uh, uh, Beverly Gaventa pointed this out to me. I think it's the J.B. Phillips translation, which was a popular paraphrase translation and Generations past mm-hmm. translates verse nineteen something like the creation waits on tiptoe yeah. for yeah. the revealing of the children of God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of eager longing, and and yeah. and Beverly, a uh, longtime Pauline scholar, describes this as um, as being at a train station. You know the train is coming. You're not sure when. You know exactly where it's coming because there are the tracks, and you're lean. Yeah, like your lovers on the train, right? And you're leaning forward craning your neck, trying to see as far down the tracks as possible um, for the light on the engine, the locomotive that you know is coming. 
that it's that kind of eager waiting and longing for something that's certain, but it's just not here yet. Here yet. Um, and that, and, and the arrival of it is is this fulfillment. And then to say that that's ascribed to the creation is fascinating. Creation is not a topic Paul talks about a lot. In fact, quite um, hardly at all. So this is where the, but his theology is always cosmic. And mm -hmm. so here's a place, especially his theology about sin and redemption. But mm -hmm. here is where the uh, his eschatology is cosmic and the sense of hope for renewal, that the the longing, the sense of disgruntlement we all have with the way things are, isn't just in my own mind, isn't just in people, that somehow all creation is subject to the same frustration and this longing for release is um i think we read it differently probably now in our own ecological age with mm -hmm. age of ecological crisis mm -hmm. but and, as we realize our own belonging to creation um mm -hmm. in ways that i think were forgotten for several generations but anyway i'm just kind of waxing about don't I've don't read over these too quickly is my I guess my advice I mentioned this before, and I'll lift it up again. Howard Snyder's book, um, Salvation is Creation Healed. Salvation is Creation Healed um, by Howard Snyder, um, which, which, which lives into what you were just describing, Matt, that, that cosmic um, a fullness of of the promise of God, uh, uh, this eschatological reality that is yet to be, uh, and and another thing that I think is another way that to point out this is the presence of the Spirit for this work here. Um, Caroline, I, I I called you out as being Wesleyan earlier, but it's all over this that it is the Spirit that is bearing bearing witness to our spirit. Um, in some ways, what has happened in Jacob happens in us at this moment where all of our longings, all of the suffering, all that we've gone through is, um, okay, Paul said this to, to, to the Corinthians, but it's, the, it's that idea more than we could think or imagine. Wow, this is what this promise is all about. This is what God has been giving us. And as we're in this liminal moment that we've talked about for these past few weeks, this is the promise that we're holding on to, even as it's being acknowledged before it has come to fruition, which is what the Matthew text is about, uh, of waiting for the long journey of the wheat and the tares, both growing together. Here we are, not yet experiencing, but confident that what God has promised, God will bring um, to, bear, to bear to pass. Yeah. And I, yeah, I love that. And I think the, what is distinctive then in that, in that tiptoe, right? Those, those tiptoe on the edge of your seat places uh, and that waiting is uh, what's distinctive for the Christian faith is the hope, right? That Paul talks about. And that, that when, when people watch us in those, you know, those longing space, pace, spaces and, you know, wondering, waiting, uh, that, that characteristic of hope is what, what is distinctive about that Christian stance. And I would maybe, uh, for the preachers who recently attended the festival of homiletics, which was back in May and the theme was hope, I would just encourage you to go back and look at some of your notes on uh, how some of those preachers talked about hope. Uh, and that that hope is not a passive, um, it's not a, a passive stance. It's an active, working place to um, where you're where you're really you're working out. <laughs> you're you are. Um, yeah, hope is something that we do. We don't hope just have. And uh, and so it's and it's what it what it's what makes believing in God and believing in the promises of Jesus. Um, that's what is visible. That's what people see. For, for the Christian, mm -hmm. for the biblical Christian, yep. hope is a strategy.